Hi students, I apologize this way of doing things. I'm giving lecture, but in the given conditions, this is the only way to overcome present difficulties. So I deeply thank Manish for his perfect organization and capability to find a solution. So here we are, and we have to talk about the role of structural geology in exploring geothermal resources. So the first question, as usual, is why? Mm -hmm. As you know, our society depends by electricity, and today we are looking more and more for the so-called green economy that implies a sustainable and renewable energy. Geothermal is one of these, uh, together with wind, solar and biomasses. So, since energy is a strong business, many investments are involved, and many of them are involved in geothermal. So, in fact, if we compare the investment for geothermal with the ones are necessary with the other systems, you can see that it is greater, but, but the geothermal systems, when it runs, is operating automatically 24 hours per day, and every day of every year. It never stops, as it occurs as winds on solar. So the life of the geothermal system is linked to the, to the turbine life, that is almost 30 years. So you can exactly predict your investment and get a lot of money if you overcome the mining risks. In other words, if you find a good geologist. So by this, now we can uh, accept the commitment from the agency, from the rich men or whatever, and then we try, we have the problem. Huh? So now we have a problem to step out from this room and find a way um, for a new area where the investment can be done. So our first step is about uh, thinking um, on the Earth planets. So Earth planets, uh, you, uh, you, as you know, uh, tends to become cold, mm? as well as the other planets of the solar system, so apart from Jupiter, with a different story. Uh, but for the Earth there is a problem. Uh, there is the radioactive crust that plays the role of a thermal blanket. Mm? given to the occurrence of the radioactive elements uh, within it. Uh, now, I have a question for you. What did you do if uh, you were forced to sleep with a, a heavy blanket during summer? Probably you will do exactly what the herd is doing. You will try to move this blanket up and down on, on your body in order to cool down as fast as possible. And this is um, called plate tectonics. So our goal is to go where this blanket is moved away. So where the hot, uh, heat escapes, hmm? close to the volcanoes or in extensional regions, as it is here illustrated. This is the map of the world heat flux and uh, so you see that apart from the oceanic reach where the heat flux is very high there are also continental areas where the heat flux is much more than the normal so the normal flux is considered about 40 millibar per square meters so there are areas where the heat flux can overcome 70 a millibat per square meter. This is a, again a magic number because above this number, this number we can consider for um, uh, geothermal resources, for the presence of geothermal resources. This is a very generic map of the hurt. The red patch indicates where the heat flux overcome 70 millibat per square meters and the the, uh, the yellow dots indicate the locations of possible geothermal resources. 
So, <clears throat> but now heat flux is not enough alone for geothermal resource. In fact, we need a tool to extract the heat from the rocks and bring it to the surface. So we need a, to we need a tool to mine heat. This tool is the water. In other words, is the rain. This is a very generic uh, map of the raininess in the earth during September. And you see that there are areas where the rain is very high, but there are also areas where the rain is very scarce. So in order to have a message about the currents of the geothermal resources, we need to join uh, the previous map, the one regarding heat flux, with this one regarding the rain. So we can recognize that Iceland is a good place, as well as Central America, as well as Indone in the Indonesia area and New Zealand, and is in part as in the Mediterranean area. The other point that is necessary to have a geothermal resource is also that this thermal energy can be reasonably exploited huh, when the costs are competitive with our other kind of energy sources. So a promising geothermal area is the one where the lithosphere is thinned, so the heat flux is very high, where the rain is present, but it is still not enough. We need something else. We need local seismicity. In fact, as you know, um, if a drop of water, a drop of rain reaches the surface and then little by little infiltrates downwards, it becomes um, heat, uh, heated and heated. And little by little, it becomes chemically aggressive. By this way, some leaching of, from the rocks can occur and the fluids from pure water become sunny fluids. When a fracture is opened, due to the drop of pressure, this sunny contact can precipitate and seal the fractures. So you need seismicity in order to maintain open fractures as it is in demonstrating on your left side. Differently, when seismicity stops, then the fractures is sealed and you get in a hydrothermal mineralized veins, as it is here demonstrated. Areas with uh, heat flux um, and local seismicity are also present in, in, in India. So why not consider India as, as, as also a possible target for geothermal explorations? I know that some projects are uh, always on course, but as it is my knowledge, the field work is uh, still missing. So what uh, I would like to, to keep, uh, say you today, tell you today is uh, the answer to this question, which kind of fieldwork for a structural geologist in, in a geothermal explorations? So what we should do is talk to contribute to construct a reliable predictive model. And this is, should be done before drillings. Boreholes are the most expansive part of the project. So if we are able to have a good model, a good geological model, then the success of drilling in increases significantly. So it implies that this is a geological, thermal and fluid and dynamic model. How to contribute to that? Of course we can contribute to, with direct data. So it implies those data that are collected at surface. Those are measurements and observation. Direct data are at the base of, for the interpretation of the indirect data, that is geophysics, and also part of a laboratory diving. 
data. Then together, direct plus indirect can uh, propose or suggest the best way of modeling hmm? analog and numerical model which are inclined to demonstrate the simulation of exploitations like that. So, okay, and here we are with the list of our duties. As a structure geologist, we should provide data regarding the geometry of geological bodies, the structures and the stress feed acting in the area under study. We should have a clear idea about the structures and depth, and then we should give numbers regarding permeability, density of fluids, and viscosity of fluids. To reach these different goals, we will we'll join together the study of fossil systems hmm, and the present system. So we will try to bridge in the past to the present. So you know, geothermal systems are through times. So we have old system now cropping out, a new system that should be exploited. To study this relationship, uh, we will use a case history that is in Italy, comparing these two locality, Alba Island being the mm, fossil analog of the present exploited Bardarello geothermal systems at depth. So now let's go to Italy. Italy is here, part of Europe. And the western part of Italy is characterized by very high heat flux. On average, in this region, Ladrello is located just there, uh, in the central part of Tuscany. Yeah. And uh, here the heat flux is, uh, on average, is 120 millibar per square meter. That implies three times the normal heat flux. Western Italy is characterized by extension tectonics and uh, the rain is quite good. The amount of rain in the region is quite good. So we have at least all the main conditions that are necessary to have, um, uh, to have geothermal resources. For this reason, in the Laderello area, the modern geothermal exploitation was born huh? in, 19, in 1904. So this is uh, in, the, in the area at the beginning. Ladrello um, was exploited for borax, that is um, uh, to get, I mean, a medical disinfectant for the, for the period. And then the region increased a lot up to the moment when this proud man was able to light a lamp using the steam in this strange machine. From that moment, the increasing of electricity, the production of electricity started up to now, uh, with, the, with the production, the production is uh, almost the 3% of all Italy. All right, if Italy is uh, our field area, just a few, few, few indications about uh, its evolution. Uh, the area we under study is Ladrello and uh, its proxy, fossil proxies, that is Elba Island. Both of them are involved in the Apennine evolution, that is an alpine chain. Collision was active up to early Miocene, and then we have post-collisional extensional tectonics up to the, the present thin lithospheric uh, um, lit uh, up to the, the present lithosphere, lithosphere the uprising of the mantle producing magmatism uh, migrating to the east together with the extension this extension is uh, defined by normal faults and transfer faults. Magmatism is normally along the transfer zones as well as hydrothermalism as indicated here by the <coughs> blue uh, squares. So in this framework let's go to our duties 
the first duty is about the geometry of a geological body. Of course, this is a matter of the active systems, so we should study the geometries within the Lodarello area or in any other localities where this comparison between fossil and present systems can be done. Uh, the, the, direct, the direct method for reconstructing geological bodies, as what you know, the use of compass, boots, uh, and observations in the field, constructing the, the geological map. After the, ge the geological map, we need geological sections, which implies occurrence of boreholes, and then you can have, as in it is today on fashion, we can have 3D visualizations of the systems as it is here sketched. So let's go on. Geometry of a geological body is, is done. Then let's go to the stress field. Stress field is still a matter of the active system. And today, the uh, stress field is normally reconstructed using seismicity and focal mechanisms. So you, as you remember, in the geothermal systems, we need seismicity. Uh, otherwise, our fractures will be closed. So the study of stress field is fundamental in order to gain indications about uh, the development of the new fractures, the new open fractures. Here in Landerello, we have indications from breakouts. And you see that breakouts is indicated by the blue lines and uh, the direction of extension is toward northeast normally. Otherwise, focal mechanisms are very confusing. As you see, you have different solutions from transcurrent to normal uh, double coupled solutions. And uh, furthermore, we have also no double coupled solutions, uh, making things more confusing. So, which is the dominant stress field? We cannot recognize from these contradictory indications. This problem, however, could, could be solved by field work. Huh? Mm -hmm. When you are in the field, in fact, you can collect also data on kinematic analysis for, for kinematic analysis and then use them for the inversion of all data to have so a comparison with focal mechanism, a direct comparison with focal mechanism. This is the way to understand and we will see the examples. There is another point why kinematics is important in uh, the study of geothermal systems. Here in the bottom you see the Andersonian theory and uh, keeping in mind this Andersonian theory and the fact that a fault is never, never a cut of knife but is always a damage zone where you can have dilatational jogs. So as it is here sketched, the dilatational jogs are commonly parallel to the uh, intermediate stress axis. So it implies that parallel to the intermediate stress axis, you can have the maximum of uh, the permeability. So the intermediate stress axis is an indication of the fluid path the preferred fluid path. So kinematic analysis is a fundamental tool in the geothermal exploration. So here you see some geologists at work. Of course, uh, kinematic analysis should be collected in a recent, in a recent structures, normally structures less than two million years. So the procedure is quite classical. After having our geological map of the area, 
we collect kinematic data in structural stations like that. And then in this case, we recognize the two main families of fractures. So you see uh, Northwest striking faults and not East striking faults. So you see the difference. These, those are mostly normal faults and those are with the two different kinematic indicators. So the first one is strike slip and the second one is um, with a strong normal component. So we can divide in two events. The first event is with uh, mm, um, with the strike slip component here for the northwest striking faults, and this is with the normal normal component for the northeast striking faults. Then the second event is normal for both cases, and planar and focal mechanisms can support this uh, interpretation by this. Then we have the last case is about the occurrence of um, Earthquakes not uh, resolvable by focal by double coupled mechanisms, and those are related to uh, clear explosion or implosions, uh, as it is the case in, uh, mm, in for the formation of hydraulic breaches. So how to explain is a um, complex framework in a common view, uh, a solution is uh, here indicated. Uh, we have a regional extension toward northeast as suggested by breakouts. Then we have faults parallel to the extension, here interpreted as a transfer faults zones. And then we have normal faults orthogonal to the main extension. When extension is prominent, these northwest, northeast trending structures, sorry, northeast trending structures, um, plays the role of strike slip and the sigma 2 is almost vertical. It implies that this direction of the intermediate strike axis can channel fluids from deep part of the crust to the surface and then following a green sigma 2 orientation, these fluids are stored in the damage zone of the fault. If uplift is uh, prominent then both systems are working as, as normal faults together with hydraulic pressure formation okay. and uplift is promoted by heat flux. So in this framework we have already an idea about what can happen in, an, in these active systems and now with this in mind we should face the other problem that we have it is about the structures that are developing at depth. Hmm? How to solve this problem? Structures at depth implies to be at about five kilometers, four or five kilometers down. So we need exactly the exhumant system. Also. At this moment, our attention moves to the uh, fossil system. And here we face another problem. The study of exhumed <coughs> fossil systems is not a novelty, of course. It is very well known in, in oil mm. investigations. And here the problem is, which is the problem here in the exhumed system? You can go in the field, measure fractures like that, but the point is you don't know the region of these fractures, since fractures can be formed during the burial phase, down, going down before in a compression system and then in a tensive system and then again back within the compression stress field, although with different characteristics. So at the end of the story, you, you do not know which is the region of the fracture, so you are measuring in the field. So to overcome this point, uh, it's very common to have a geostatistic approach or a numerical approach in order to simulate evolution of fractures uh, considering the Andersonian theory. However, in exhumant system we have an advantage 
respect to the oil systems. In fact, in the geothermal oil systems, we have hydrothermal minerals filling fractures. So it implies that uh, the system is fossilized and the relationship between fluid flow and fractures is uh, blocked at that conditions. And so we can really study what occurred at that time before exhumation. So uh, now let's go to see something about Elba Island that is our exhumed system with respect to the Lardarello area. Here we are. This is a general map of uh, um, Elba Island. Elba is characterized by two different uh, plutons, one to the west and the other one to the east. The one to the east is the one that we are going to consider since uh, its uh, hydrothermal circulation is almost completely preserved today. From a structural point of view, the Eva is characterized by low angle normal faults and transfer zones, oblique faults. So, since uh, it, it is exhumed, uh, we can have a view from deep level to the shallower level. Okay? And it implies that at deeper structural level we have minerals with higher temperature of crystallizations. So the first event of crystallizations in the area is characterized by tourmaline, by this mineral, by the crystallization from tourmaline, and we will find tourmaline in the shear zones, in the Brito shear zones. This is uh, the damage zone. The normal, zone, the normal faults and the low angle normal faults completely characterized by tourmaline and we have striations as you see here in the low angle normal faults and even hydraulic breaches. Mm -hmm. So temperature of crystallization of tourmaline and quartz here is about 500 degrees so we are very close to the heat source. Tourmaline is also concentrated in strike sleep or oblique sleep um, shear zones. So in the same framework we have, in the same moment I would say, since tourmaline is present in both cases, we have strike sleep and normal faults tectonics huh, together, working together. At shallower structural levels Tourmalize is no more present, but we have iron oxidize and hydroxides as hematite and pyrite. And here again, um, hydroxides are present in normal faults like that, as well as in uh, uh, shear, um, oblique shear zones. In these oblique shear zones, we can have the overlap of two kinematic indicators. The first one is almost asleep and the second one is uh, with a large component of normal movement as well as we have seen in the Lardarello area. So in this sketch we can assume that uh, the oblique uh, lateral movement is connected to the transfer zones um, moving up or driving up uh, fluids uh, where tourmaline today is uh, present and then these fluids can laterally migrate in the damage zones of the normal faults uh, as it is here indicated in, in several outcrop examples. When fluids uh, tend to be concentrated in the damage zone of the normal faults we get uh, the mining areas as it is this is the case. Okay so now we have a conceptual model, a geometrical conceptual model implying fluid flow and that is characterized by um, oblique slip faults, channeling meteoric water at depth. This meteoric water is becoming a chemically aggressive due to its heating and little by little is therefore concentrated along the normal faults. Mm -hmm following, therefore, the orientation of the intermediate stress axis. This conceptual model should be integrated with geochemistry data, of course, and with geophysics, okay, that is, MT 
and active seismicity. So by the moment, we can assume that this integration is well done. So we are perfect online, and therefore we can pass to the other points. We have solved direct and indirect data, and then we should go toward modeling, facing the other the parameters point points that those are give numbers about permeability, density of fluid, and viscosity of fluids. And now uh, I can show you a method to reach these points. Hence, let's let's go to permeability. Permeability is studied assuming the parallel plate model. So we have two plates hmm, to a certain distance is each other, along which a laminar flow is present. Hmm. The permeability of this fracture should be less than 10 to minus 12 square meters. Hmm. So it implies numbers about 15, 14, like that. So the relationship with between permeability and fractures are given by this equation proposed by Gale, and you see that the parameters, uh, the included parameters are fractures, width, and length, plus other parameters for the direction, fluid flow, and type of fractures. This group of parameters were studied by Nicole et al., uh, uh, who suggested that the, those values are in the range, uh, you see, 10 to minus 6. This is quite important for us, because this order of magnitude remains the same even if the fracture is planar or rough or smooth rough fractures. Okay. So then the other parameter that we need is uh, the connectivity among fractures. Huh? This connectivity could range between 1 and 0 0.1. 1 is the perfect connectivity, 0 0.1 is the worst. So we can choose uh, parameters in the middle, 0 0.4. So our initial uh, equation is therefore modified as follow. Permeability it depends on width and length of the fractures, then multiplied by a factor of productivity, assume that it's 0, 4, and then 10 to minus 6. So it implies that average fracture width and fracture length can be measured in the field. Okay? So the examples that I'm going to show you is coming from the Ilba Island and exactly for, from a structural deep part located close to the heat source, and so the cooling magma and the cooling magma of the Miocene period. In this area, we have mica schist, mica schist intruded by dikes, by granite dikes, bringing tourmaline in the systems as we see. And of course, the paragenesis of the rock is characterized by a, a high temperature metamorphism. Occurrence of mica schist with dike and tourmaline is also the evidence of the deep boreals in, in, in the Ladarello area. So we can assume that this uh, outcrop in Ilba Island is a perfect proxy of the present deep reservoir in the geothermal area. So here we are in the field again. In this area with mica schists, uh, three generations of, of fractures can be recognized. The oldest one is characterized by low angle normal faults with tourmaline, as we have already seen. Then the second one is again with tourmaline and characterized by high angle normal faults with a different orientation. And finally, we have mm, uh, some fractures with ports, with ports as the third generation. So in this framework, how to proceed? Uh, the first step is to find an area here in this outcrop. Uh, we study three different areas, and I will show you this uh, area one. 
is here. So when you have defined your area, you need a detailed geological map, structured geological map. So given the scale, you need a meter rope like that, then the compass and the millimetric uh, and millimetric uh, papers. Of course, today you can do also using drones and something else, but I always suggest to do things by hand at least one time in order to get the feeling with the points. So you reconstruct the system, this is the scale, uh, yellows are the dikes, like that, the, the dikes, and then you have mm, the red patches are red line and red patches are the faults characterized by tourmaline uh, related to the first generation faults and the other gray blue lines uh, the gray lines are related to the second generation of fractures and finally uh, scan lines are indicated by blue lines scan lines are those lines hmm? that we have chosen orthogonal to the main structures. Along these lines, we are going to consider the spacing and frequency of mineralized fractures. And here we have different examples. Colors are related to the, to the different generation of fractures we were studying by the moment. Finally, along each scan line we can set different scan boxes those are squares like that and now we are going to measure within each scan box the length and the width of each mineralized fractures we can recognize by eye or by pictures huh? in the lab later on so uh, after this study, we will have data about the frequency of fractures along the scan line, and then we have length and width within each scan line. So a huge amount of data. This is an example. This is scan box one. Within the scan box one, we have one data related to the first generation and several data related to the third generation of fractures we recognize. Then applying this methodology, we can have permeability for the each fractures we measure within each scan line. So we have a really a huge amount of data. And the question is, which is the value? Huh? Which is the value? Of course, if we have a lot of data, we need an average. Uh, using the geometric average for the first generation, permeability is estimated in the order of 10 minus 15 the second generation is 10 to minus 14 and then the third one is 10 to minus 17 so almost nothing so what's important to see that the deep uh, geothermal reservoir in Valderello uh, today has permeability was measured in the order minus 14, minus 15. So really comparable with the method we, we adopted. All right, now let's go to see what we can do for the other parameters, density and viscosity of, of fluids. Of course, so we are studying relationship between structures and fluid flow. So we need characteristics of fluids. And to study density and viscosity, we need to study fluid inclusions. So we need also, therefore, cooperation with colleagues. Huh? And fluid inclusions are portion of the parental hydrothermal fluids that remain trapped within crystals during the crystallizations. Huh? So there are methods to estimate pressure, temperature, and composition of fluids at the moment of their crystallizations. And these data can be reported in a diagram explaining salinity toward temperature. So looking into our tourmaline rich, um, tourmaline, 
tomarine rich veins we have this location in the diagram so the fluids the parental fluids for tomarine um, was characterized by temperature of about 600 degrees and the salinity of about 25 so it implies it implies a magmatic origin and temperature very high so for the first generation we have salinity at about 23 and temperature and density as you see uh, estimated by um, by these computations so what we do what we can do having this information about salinity temperature using salinity temperature we can reconstruct viscosity uh, still using uh, equations that are um, published uh, since a period so we have also viscosity of fluids and then when we have permeability viscosity uh, density and viscosity of fluids we can have the hydraulic conductivity for the different generations of fractures at that structural level so it implies we have numbers that could be used for the numerical simulation of the conceptual model and so now we need another colleague specialized in modeling it could be a structural geologist or a physician or a mathematician but we should compute um, the possibility to exploit our resource without decrement okay and if things are perfect as we suppose to be able to do then we can set up the drilling and if, if things are success here we are okay, okay. okay. Uh, When the steam is got then we have pipes eh, that are able to drive this steam toward uh, the power plant and then electricity is got so in conclusions we were able to have a, a key for the interpretation of indirect data so uh, our field work was useful to explain anti-seismicity active seismics and gravity data normally we can propose a conceptual model then we have using uh, hydrothermal minerals and fractures we were able to recognize the process and parameters uh, uh, that are useful for modeling please take note that parameters are normally got after drilling but today using these joint studies in fossil and, and present system from field data we can have a reliable information that are normally obtained after drilling so this is a really a key point eh, for for our work finally here you get a list of papers that can be used for your studies and uh, uh, from I used these papers for preparing these lectures. So that's all. Thanks for your attention and have a good job.